Hello, my name is Nathaniel Oscar. It's my great pleasure to be here today to share with you some insights into how a growing class of computational models we use to inform decision making and interpretation of trends in public health epidemiology can be leveraged by a new phase of the computational revolution, namely the rise of sensor bearing smartphones and other consumer electronics devices. Now the context of this work lies in the growing use of computational models to inform public health decision making, interpretation of trends, prioritization of data collection, etc. Increasingly these models involve sophisticated dynamic hypotheses for how things operate in the world that need to be grounded by actual observation. Such models also typically exhibit a wide variety of parameter values, information required for the initial state of the model, and other components that require a copious amount of data to ground the model. <clears throat> Whether the models are aggregate in character and simply stratified by, by a variety of dimensions, in which case they need large amounts of cross-sessional data, or if they're individual-based and they need to make use value use of a large amount of longitudinal and cross-sectional information. These models often exhibit an inordinate appetite for data. A second major thread of context for this work is the growing rise of smartphones and other consumer electronic devices. What few people realize is well, these devices offer incredible functionality, which is, has caused remarkable uptake in their use. Some of the most compelling functions are made possible through the provision of a wide variety of sensors. Whether it's commonly used uh, uh, sensors for, for research, such as accelerometers or GPS devices, or a variety of, of other types of sensors that we're not used to thinking of in that way, such as the presence of, of Wi-Fi, presence of um, Bluetooth, presence of uh, cameras and, and microphones used in um, daily use of smartphones, or even things used behind the scenes such as batteries. Those sensors help make that functionality possible. And what's most notable for this work is that sensors can be repurposed at little or no cost to their original function to collect research data. This is particularly made possible and made compelling by the presence of a wide variety of wireless signals in which individuals circulate day to day. Whether it's Wi-Fi connections over which we regularly communicate data or Skype with our family, whether it's Bluetooth used to stream music to our headsets, or GPS used to locate us in our morning run. These, device, these types of signals are routinely used for, for communication or for understanding aspects of our context. And such signals too, like the broader set of, sig of sensors on these systems, can be repurposed to provide other information, information regarding our context such as the uh, location, indoors or outdoors, uh, proximity, uh, degree of proximity between individuals, or to broadly disambiguate our context, such as to classify whether we're indoors or outdoors. Now, there's a growing number of systems that seek, seek to bring these two aspects of context together and collect information of relevance to epidemiology. I'm going to be talking here about our so-called iEpi system an Android-based smartphone application running on uh, Android Ice Cream Sandwich and earlier versions of Android that make use of commodity Android hardware to provide a rich and um, diverse set of sensor-based measurements that can form epidemiological insight. The fact that these the system runs on richly functional smartphones is very important as it provides an internal incentive for people to carry the device and keep it charged, keep it operational. We make use of diverse sensor modalities and provide context-triggered 
surveys, which can be used to elicit further understanding of context from the user and to disambiguate sensor data. Episodic data collection bursts within this device, say every five or ten minutes, help prolong battery life, but collect a wide variety of sensors. And there's an opportunistic batter, uh, data backhaul that's used to collect data throughout a study. This data backhaul brings, uh, brings data from the smartphone, shown on the left, in an encrypted form, to uh, a server, shown on the right, in an opportunistic fashion, using Wi-Fi or cellular connections data on the left is notable for including not only onboard sensors but potentially external sensors such as the presence of a Wii balance board, um, presence of uh, the use of uh, survey collected data uh, collected through the phone, and use of the smartphone to collect um, uh, snapshots such as uh, food that people have eaten. That data is brought back to the server where it can be analyzed, most notably for this talk where we can run simulations on it using agent-based or other types of aggregate data. Now the system is designed to collect information relevant to a wide variety of health considerations including aspects of, of location, physical proximity, spatial proximity, and aspects of social context, and communication behavior, all of which give insight into um, a wide variety of health conditions, either uh, the presence of the health condition directly, aspects of risk factors for that health condition, etc. So we can um, leverage different sensors to provide information on a variety of aspects of context. And external sensors, such as the Wii Balance Board for weight measurements, are used to collect additional information, um, complementing that which can be collected on the smartphone. Without particularly privileging them, I, I show some examples of sorts of data that can be collected from particular sensors here, such as uh, participant, participant contacts, um, with participants shown here in red, or contacts with other non-participants um, as judged by the um, presence of discoverable smartphones shown here in blue over the course of one month. Accelerometer data related to physical activity throughout a day, aggregated here over participants for different times of day, so geographic movement, both within a city in the upper right and across the country shown here in the, the lower left. We can also indicate people's movement between various spaces. Putting aside the issue of latitude and longitude, there may be many spaces essentially at the same latitude and longitude, such as different rooms uh, nearby in a building, which qualifies different spaces or different floors of that same building. And we can map out the spaces in which individuals circulate and the amount of time they spend in different spaces. Such information can be used, for example, to to establish contact durations between any two individuals, information that it's hard to elicit through traditional survey instruments. Now a key constraint for all of this sort of information is the need to conserve energy. Um, and indeed this is the primary data collection constraint with which we deal. Uh, adverse impacts on smartphone battery life can lower amount of collected data due to three things. First of all, um, it can on some occasions lead to phone battery exhaustion, um, which uh, precludes us for collecting information at certain times during the day. Perhaps more importantly, it can also uh, yield reduced compliance and morale on the part of participants and reduced inclination to carry the phones because they offer less um, functionality in a mode where their battery starved or where the battery is exhausted. It can also lead to more or less permanent uh, battery capacity reduction. So power optimization and judicious choice of sampling rates and tracking battery lifetime is really key. Fortunately, what we can take advantage of here is a uh, cousin of so-called Moore's Law. Many of those in the room will be familiar with Moore's Law, which in recent decades has, has posited that the number of uh, transistors associated with a given chip will approximately double over eight, 18 months, le leading toward corresponding increase in the power computers. Well, this law has been um, blunted in recent years in terms of its impact on outright computer speed by um, quantum limits. We do see a, um, an, an, uh, a steady rise in a log linear, that is uh, exponential over time fashion, the number of computations that can be performed per kilowatt hour. In short, the efficiency, the power efficiency of computations. 
We also take advantage um, within this context of, of the potential for cross-linking of data. And the observations here mirror Metcalfe's law in the computer network side. Metcalfe's law, first formulated by Bob Metcalfe, the inventor of Ethernet, um, posits that the value of a network rises uh, not linearly with the number of nodes in the network, but with a square, because each successive node added um, benefits from recourse to communication with all previous nodes added. Similarly, as, as we grow number of sensors, the value of those sensors, I would argue, rises um, superlinearly with the number of existing sensors. And indeed, some of the greatest value of, of this information comes from cross-linking sensor. So, for example, we can map out people's activity levels of space. We can characterize resources available um, within people's activity spaces. And we can map up the locations of contacts between individuals over geography or within various spaces, putting aside the issue of latitude longitude. Now, a, a foremost uh, consideration for all of this lies in security and confidentiality of data. And to help ensure these things, we provide a, a stage process, <coughs> which begins with informed consent, but also involves providing participants and helping make sure they're, they're aware of the operation of a snooze operation for disabling data recording due to sensitive periods. We also provide strong on-device encryption, secure transmission, and some other, some other options to help ensure that the, the information that is collected is collected in a, in a confidential fashion. Now, I began my talk with motivating this work by the needs of models. And indeed, there's a natural synergy, bi-directional synergy, between the use of the sensor data on the one hand and dynamic models. Dynamic models can make strong use of this data and linking to decision making. But those models also help us um, uh, filter the data, plus uh, clean out noise, capture regularities, fill gaps between data points, and understand the proximal and distal implications of observed behavior. It can help also help us um, improve the uh, power efficiency by adaptive sampling. Together with models, for example, can leverage this data to do things like identify potential infection hotspots across the city to understand the implications uh, for, for intervention um, of contact patterns in the population for particular pathogens the impact of things like, like vaccination on individual risk. Now, an interesting aspect of our work has been in highlighting the fact that sensor-based data may not only present an opportunity for models, to enrich models, but in some cases may effectively be a requirement for, for high-fidelity, um, accurate decision-making with respect to those models specifically high-resolution temporal and spa spatial data of the sort that we can get from these phones may essentially be a requirement for accurate conclusions with respect to certain types of epidemiological processes and contexts. And our analysis suggests that the use of microcontact data may be required for accuracy in, in some areas. I I'm going to provide two vignettes, but they're joined by the fact that they're both what, what we term data knockout experiments. So we collect a, a wide variety of rich data, data here collected over five or ten minute intervals empirically, which, um, and then we construct a variety of counterfactual experiments that approximate the data collect under less extensive sorts of experimental conditions. In essence, simulating um, um, the, uh, the outcome of, of various types of computational experiments when we only have recourse to lower fidelity data, to data that's collected much richly. For example, where we're sampling at, at on a less frequent basis, or for, uh, sampling for just one day where we may have actually sampled for months. Um, where we aggregate the data up, for example, where we may have very precise models, but static models, regarding um, people's contact patterns instead of the fully detailed dynamic models. Now, for each such counterfactual experiment, we can run an ensemble of simulations, say in an agent-based model, and compare the results from that sort of uh, scenario, um, that ensemble, with results that we get from the uh, most detailed case. 
Now, time considerations can prevent me from going into this in detail, but um, suffice it to say that in both these cases, we, we used an agent-based model driven over time by observed um, contact uh, histories, and we, we then observe um, the, uh, the outcomes in terms of uh, transmission of an infection, of an ILI, an influenza-like illness within the population. And what we found is that the data that, even data that was highly fit to, um, to observations from the phones, or static networks, very precisely calibrated to, to match the, um, the density, uh, the probability density of contacts between individuals, gave results at wide variance with what we, what we found with the most detailed data available. I particularly highlight the fact that um, the wide variety of studies, it seems that the wide variety of studies of this sort, which choose a day as typical and collect microcontact data only on that day, or, or studies collected with static networks, gave results that were that could be very, very different from what we got with the most detailed data. Particularly choosing different days as, quote, typical, pausing different days as typical could lead to a huge variety of, of different outcomes. So the implications here is network dynamics are important for capturing sorts of certain sorts of processes um, with accuracy. And to be effective, um, for some applications at least, we need to collect microcontact data with a certain scale, a certain richness, uh, going beyond one day of data collection. A second study looked at the impact of sampling frequency and because of, of uh, time. I don't have time to go into this. Suffice to say, we used a, a similar model, and we found that um, going from something like five-minute sampling, sampling contact patterns every five minutes, to less frequent sampling, say every hour or every three hours, even though that's still sampling a lot of information about contact patterns, to what you could gain through traditional survey instruments, say, it really impaired the accuracy of our simulations to use that sort of downsampled data. There's a variety of challenges here. I, I don't have time to go into in detail. Um, first and foremost, the challenge among battery life versus data volume. But perhaps the foremost challenge I want to highlight here is creating generative models that will explain the observed contact patterns um, in, a, in an organic, you know, emergent fashion. There's a variety of opportunities for articulating um, studies that will answer key research questions at this phase of of uh, sensor uh, sensor enabled computational epidemiology. So, in conclusion, sensors are increasingly ubiquitous. Commodity sensor bearing devices can serve a dual use of sensor platforms, and we can repurpose communication signals for for location. Coupled with models, uh, such sensor data can offer a significant insight. But we need to make use of that that data in a sensible fashion, and it does seem that that richly frequent and long-term studies are required for uh, accurate insight into certain, to certain opportunities. And broadly speaking, this sort of data can greatly complement other data in the big data revolution to, to inform epidemiological insight. I'd like to, to, uh, to offer my sincere thanks to a variety of co collaborators uh, for this funding, and I'd like to open, open it up to questions. Thank you very much.